Good morning, Gate City. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you know, I just love hearing the hum. There's, there's a good chatter around the tables. This is good. Let's see. Uh, who has our invocation this morning? I know who it is. I know who it is. Yeah. Dan, will you uh, lead us in the We'll start there. All right. Pledge and invitation. Yeah. Um, well, first off, I want to thank everybody for all the offers to cover me on my uh, conference room. And then Cody V's covering me here, but he said I've had to pray for it. So I <laughs> find my glasses and we will do this. So bow your heads, please. Oh God of time and eternity, help us look to the past with gratitude and to the future with hope. We remember this, this day those who have gone before us here, who labored not for themselves alone, but for the vision of building for the future a world better than they had known. Inspire us also in the like vision that we too may labor for things beyond ourselves, that our lives may be dedicated to high purposes and grand horizons. Make us unafraid of hopes and dreams. Release us from cynicism and despair. Teach us to be realistic about our limitations, but never to lose hope in our potential to transcend them. Amen. <coughs>
brought uh, come on. <laughs> I brought Chuck with me this morning. It's um, <laughs> Sadie's. I know she's a little shy when you put her out like this, but uh, it's Sadie's first day of kindergarten, and Marley didn't know how long carpool would take, so the nannies are on strike, so we split pairs, and <laughs> this is where we are. So that's the start. Say good morning, Marley. Guys, Sadie, Marley, Chuck, Simon is here for a second week in a row, which is a good sign. I can actually have a real friend, I guess. <laughs> Very good. That's uh, end of our new guest because we have some right. other festivities. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Kim. Simon, I'm glad we didn't scare you off. No, you didn't. Glad to be around. And Brittany, it sounds like what you do, keep the nuclear weapons out of our non state actors' hands. It sounds like a page out of uh, the 24 series that we might have watched years ago. It's not nearly that exciting. <laughs> but we do appreciate you keeping them out of our non state actors' hands. <laughs> Yeah, Nick, let's do uh, birthdays and announce uh, anniversaries real quick. Yes, sir. We've got a couple coming up this week. Jeff Tillman up here at the camera. Uh, got a birthday coming up on the 26th. That's right. Oh, birthday there, Jeff. <laughs> and we have some club anniversaries this week. Uh, Gigi Hughes, no, I saw Steve, okay. They both uh, have two year anniversaries. Uh, both came into the club uh, on the 23rd. So this is their anniversary day today. And Tony is uh, has his anniversary date coming on the 24th. And uh, you know how many years, Tony? I Three. guess uh, maybe 12. Maybe 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, mentioned last week, Dr. Sears and Sarah having their 52nd anniversary. If that was such a good one, it's worth mentioning twice because it just happened there on the 20th. Right, so that's it for this week. Thank you, Rick. Today is a very special day. Not only do we have one, we have two inductions today. Robbie, can I call you up to uh, present our new members, please? Well, I'd like to uh, ask their sponsoring members to join us as we uh, the new members come forward. Tom Nelson, introduce uh, and tell us a little about your new members that you're responding here. Uh, I've met Dale Hubbard a couple times. He, he um, visited here, I don't know, three or four times. Y'all saw his letter to go went out. But he's a well-established veteran um, with the SBA through self-help. Uh, he's been in this community for a number of years. And as y'all know, he's past president of the Rotary Club in, um, over in Charlotte. So he's going to be great. Right now. My friend Mike Bowers, I met him with some lawn care and come after a few conversations realized uh, we both lived in Rhode at a similar time and I had worked with his dad at the newspaper. His dad, not directly, but his dad was in charge of the news division. And he's a Hokie graduate from Duke Tech and um, it's a pleasure getting to know him. Well, we welcome you both. Uh, AT Rotary was founded in 1991, almost 30 years ago, consistent with the precepts of our wonderful organization internationally and what was founded first in 1905. And we welcome you, uh, David Mike, this morning. We welcome you for the uh, not only your strong arms and sturdy brats, but for the contributions, gifts, and talents that we know you will bring on behalf of, of your efforts and uh, what you have to bring to our great community here. It's worth uh, being mindful at this point of noting as uh, we celebrate being members of Rotary uh, what it's about and what it's not about. First of all, uh, Rotary is not a political organization, yet it is dedicated to the encouragement of good citizenship and the uh, strong engagement and encouragement of good men and women in and out of public office. Secondly, Rotary is not a religious organization but it is dedicated to and was founded upon the very timeless moral precepts and values that have made and expanded the greatness of our community and our country and Rotary itself. 
And third, Rotary is not a charitable organization, but there are wonderful opportunities to give back uh, through sweat equity, through our wonderful foundation, through other opportunities of engagement uh, and philanthropy uh, in, in kind and in part as well, uh, both uh, around the corner and around the world. Because uh, Rotary is, in fact, uh, an organization of professional men and women dedicated to the highest precepts and ethical standards within and for our professions, collectively engaged, doing work uh, for the common good, consistent with our motto of service above self, and consistent with the four-way test uh, that we exercise in our daily life and that we declare each week at our meetings. And with that in mind, I ask the uh, gathering to stand at this time as I go to the following <laughs> Dave and Mike. Uh, you have been brought forth for membership and its consideration and entry uh, for the Gate City Rotary Club here. We are proud that you have made this determination. We are honored to have you aboard. And uh, mostly, uh, we want to, you to be mindful that from this point forward, uh, you have been brought in because you have uh, demonstrated those precepts and tenets from within your stated vocations and chosen avenues of service in life uh, that you will be able to bring to this club, for which we will all value and the engagement we have from uh, the different organizations and vocations in which we uh, all participate. Conversely, from this point forward, you will also be ambassadors of Rotary, whether it's by uh, wearing this distinctive pin, which you will be receiving shortly, or, or by uh, engaging and living out uh, what we uh, declare to be our code and what we value as Rotarians, as you will meet fellow Rotarians everywhere to help you uh, walk this walk together. And so at this time, I'd act to ask all of you uh, to uh, extend the hand of fellowship and welcome our new folks aboard. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think our club secretary, Steve, has some wonderful uh, entry gifts for you as well. So welcome again. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, folks, I'm, I apologize. I came to stick around for the happy dollar I got to give, but I got a hearing in Raleigh at 9, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Robbie, come back and do happy dollars next week. There you go. Thank you. What, what are you trying to do? When you give her a dollar, you send us an email. Yay! <laughs> 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 So I was looking over at Mike's bio uh, the other day, and I noticed he graduated from Virginia Tech the year that I stepped on campus for my, my experience in Pinocchio Land. So looks like Mike's more, uh, looks like Mike was uh, more successful. I noticed he graduated from Virginia Tech. <laughs> uh, announcements. Uh, board chairs, do we have any announcements today? Are you ready to make, want to make, or things we need to talk about? Well, I have one that I, Lisa, Please. Can I make a quick announcement on your behalf? On September 12th, we're going to have an uh, opportunity to invite uh, potential uh, prospects, potential members to uh, learn a little bit more about Rotary, and get to know Rotary at Mark Luttrell's house. So put that on your calendar. If you've been thinking, I have someone I'd like to invite, but I just never seem to get around to it, September 12th will be that opportunity at Mark Luttrell's house. Okay, that is, uh, I think that's all the announcements I have. Anybody else? When is uh, uh, District Governor Claudia coming? We need to make sure we have a full house when she comes. Oh, That's coming up September 6th. September 6th. We, six. September <laughs> six. Yeah, we, it's, we got it on the calendar. All right. <laughs> and we'll remind you, Mike. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Well, well, you know, Walt is, uh, I'm grateful that he's here to keep me in order. Do we have any happy, can we do some happy dollars, a lightning yes. round of happy dollars? Happy dollars! <laughs> Y'all were so mean to me last week, I don't mean, uh, I mean. They were bad jokes. I was at prom, go ahead. Five uh, Judy Brum and her team worked real hard to duplicate a sign that I originally copied from the 1810 Tavern sign in Connecticut. They worked very hard, the whole team on it, and I'd like to thank them very much for doing that. Awesome. 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 Also, y'all said a couple times about our 52nd wedding anniversary last week. A couple of years ago, a guy heard I'd been married 50 years, and he was getting ready to get married, and he asked what was the key to my success, and I told him I tried to always get him the last word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a big one. So, 
uh, it's apropos I'm sitting next to you because, uh, you know, my son Tyler. So Tyler and his wife Jamie are going to have a little girl in February. I'd like to present a half dollar or five. Or five. We recognize David Crabtree and Randy uh, Randy uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hope that guy. Great, uh, great ride across uh, Africa. Congratulations, you guys, and uh, glad to have you back home safe and sound. Thank you. So, um, saw Bobby Richardson last night at uh, Trent Woods and his wife, and he wanted to say something to y'all this morning. Yo! Who was Well, I did just want to thank Dan again for pinching me for uh, invitation this morning. So I emailed before I went out of town, and the reply that the person that requested to do invitation uh, is actually out of town this week was still buried in my email until I saw it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say, you know, sometimes people will receive an award or they'll be mentioned in the paper, and if you don't confess, it costs you two bucks. I'm just sitting at the room for you now. Good morning. Uh, I'm a little late on this because A, I have not been sleeping and just plain forgot, but uh, Jackson Dean Kaiser arrived August 3rd. Mama is a champ, uh, and he healthy. Uh, the only thing we're looking forward to now is sleep. <laughs> a member of the big blue nation they call it not, not in Chapel Hill this one in Lexington Kentucky we dropped Meredith off she went to her first classes yesterday she made it we didn't hear from her for about a week so I guess she's doing okay <laughs> <laughs> empty nesters went out to the golf tournament and I had to drive the wife home <laughs> We got Wilder home from South America after we hadn't seen him since March. He's been down there seven months. He flies in Saturday night, spends four days pretty much in the house, most of it asleep, I think. Goes back to school on Wednesday, ten days early. We go down Sunday to help him move in. Of course, Carrie's about to have a fit to get down there. I gotta go see. We gotta get to the videos. And we're down there, we get there about 11 o'clock, we're hanging these pictures and helping him straighten up the apartment and all that. Wallace says, you know guys, it's uh, 10 or 2, I've got a rush party at 2. Y'all just finish up here anytime. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. So it only gets worse, Tommy. <laughs> Uh, I'll just say quickly because it'll take a while. Thank you guys all for your financial support, your prayers while David and I are in Africa. Got back about 24 hours ago, so I'm running on jet fumes right now. So I can't, really can't put a cognizant thought together. So don't ask me really hard questions. <laughs> but it was an unbelievable experience. And David, thank you again for your vision and putting it together. Unbelievable opportunity. So thank you guys. I was the recipient of his tickets last week in the Panthers game. It was the first one I got to take Jenna to as a Panthers fan. She grew up in right outside New York City as a Giants fan, so that was uh, especially exciting. And uh, I tend not to go to those things because every time I go to a Panthers game, they lose. And for the first time ever, they won. <laughs> first one's for the guy who loaned me the happy dollar about a year and a half ago. I cannot remember who it was. It was me. It was me. I'm not sure <laughs> For Hope Ride, for, for Randy Elliott, uh, for Jim Kennedy, who's constant encouragement, just constant encouragement, really means a lot. That's a gift that you have, and you bless a lot of people in this club with it, but I'm, I'm really grateful for it. For Tom Richardson, for just backing us and standing with us, for an amazing trip, for the North team and for the South team. These guys on the South team were just absolutely, absolutely amazing. For no injuries, for, no, you know, it was really great. Crossed my 4,000th African mile uh, on this trip, which was was really cool, and I was kind of aware of where I was when that was going on, and the scenery was absolutely blow your blow your mind. 
And so I thought, I'm the luckiest guy in the world just to be here and to, to be doing this. And when I started Oprah, I wanted to raise a million dollars on a on a bicycle for world missions, and we passed a million dollars. Oh, so, wow. yeah. Thanks for all the kind emails and support of the emails especially. Thank you. <laughs> lawyer of the year about best <laughs> lawyers of uh, in, uh, national thing. It was, uh, it was for, for Greensboro. So. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a national publication, but it, it, it was based upon... For best lawyer to take. <laughs> 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 I'm not even sure. There's a lawyer. <laughs> And modest too. Well, Grand Patrick Lewis used to always tell me, never stop trying to exceed your limitations. The rest of us need the entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, continuing with the uh, legal theme that we've established this morning, uh, the Robbie Hassel Show and everything, our gifted lawyers, us, our speaker today, is uh, Seth Howe. He is the district administrator for the Guardian Ad Litem program in Guilford County. He's been with them for 11 years. Um, undergrad from uh, Wake Forest, one of the greatest schools in the southeast, where my daughter attended, and uh, got his master's in public administration at UNCG. Um, lives in Kernersville with his wife Amy and three girls. That's correct. How old are your girls? Yeah. Nine and three-year-old twins. Oh, boy. You know they're going to get married someday. Uh, <laughs> Any financial advice? Start saving now. <laughs> uh, anyway, he's going to tell us about the Guardian Ad Life program in uh, Gilbert County. So please welcome Seth Howard. Good morning, everyone. I've also brought one of our um, volunteer guardians ad litem, Leslie Morgan, with me. So Leslie's up here and she's going to help me through this presentation to give you some real world examples of what we do for children. Um, I want to start off by saying that Walt and Chip have been very welcoming to us this morning and have uh, graciously offered us breakfast. And I told them that uh, I was not going to partake because I didn't want to eat before I spoke. But uh, truthfully, uh, usually at 7 o'clock, I'm laying in bed wondering how can I actually get to the courthouse by 8 o'clock today. So uh, it's humbling to know that there's a group of community leaders meeting every week at 7 a.m. Uh, helping to make this world a better place while I'm still in my pajamas. So thank you for everything you all do. Um, I'm here to talk today about the Guardian Ad Litem program through our North Carolina Juvenile Court System. Um, the, Let's take a real quick poll. If, raise your hand and keep it in the air if you have a child in your life that you care about, love, somebody in your life, a juvenile, you've had one, a daughter, a son, niece or nephew. Sure, everyone, great, yeah. We should have everyone's hand up, right? Now keep your hand up if you've ever had to go to the courthouse, had to be a part of a, a trial, had to uh, go for a ticket, do anything up at the courthouse before, all right? Okay. Now, how many of you would like for that child that you care about to be the one that has to go into that courtroom, speak to a judge, have a lot of information be shared about them? Leave your hand up if you like that thought. Yeah, I think most of us would drop that hand. Uh, court's not a fun place typically for children to have to be. And the children that our program represents um, are children who have been abused and neglected by their parents or caretakers and have been removed from their parents' custody by our uh, County Department of Social Services and have brought them into the court system and our program exists to be the advocate for those children be the voice for those children so they have somebody watching out for them and speaking up for them where there are decisions being made in the court system about their lives um, so today I hope to educate you on the Guardian Ad Litem program and, and help uh, through Leslie's stories really illustrate what our volunteers do for children in uh, Guilford County um, I have some slides about the judicial branch of government just so you can have some background. I won't go through all of the uh, information on here, but um, I will point out that the guardian ad litem functions in the district court system, which handles most of the flow of uh, uh, court cases that go in and out of the court system. 
Um, there are, uh, there are lots of different types of cases that are heard in the district court system, um, criminal cases that include misdemeanors and uh, some criminal <coughs> matters and felony cases. Domestic relations cases like divorces, child support, domestic violence are all heard in the district court system. Um, and most importantly, juvenile matters are heard in the district court system. Uh, there are two types of juvenile matters, primarily delinquency cases where a juvenile has committed a crime, uh, but most importantly, the most important court in our entire court system, in my mind, is the Abuse Neglect Dependency Court. That's for these children who have been abused or neglected and had to be forcibly removed from their parents' home. That's where their cases reside. And that's where the Guardian Ad Litem program solely functions. Uh, the term Guardian Ad Litem, um, for those non-attorneys in the room, it's uh, not a familiar term most people know. Um, it mean, it's a Latin term. It means uh, guardian for the suit or for the court case. Uh, and it's a term that is used in several different uh, civil court settings. A guardian ad litem is someone a judge appoints to speak for someone who can't speak for themselves. That's always a juvenile in the court system. Uh, it can be an adult who can't make decisions on their own. Um, but uh, solely in the juvenile court system, in the guardian ad litem program, are community volunteers recruited, screened, trained, coached and guided to be guardian ad litem advocates for the court system. Um, we have a, a nationwide program. Every state in uh, the USA has a uh, similar uh, program like guardian ad litem. They're called CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates in some states, so you may have heard of that. Um, but our, our goal nationwide is that every child who's abused or neglected has a voice in the court system. Um, we only get involved in children's lives when um, abuse or neglect has occurred in their family. Uh, and that means parents have failed to provide a safe, stable environment for their child. Uh, there have been um, hardships in that home of various types that have led to them, um, those children being at imminent risk of, of, of further harm if they are not removed from their parents' custody. And that's when our local Department of Social Services has the option, after they've exhausted all their options of helping a family uh, uh, treat their issues, uh, their last option is to forcibly remove those children from the home and involve them in the juvenile court system. Um, when children are removed, uh, they're placed into relatives' homes who are willing or able to take care of those children. Uh, they're placed in licensed foster homes with strangers that they've never met, people being paid to take care of uh, those children. Or they're placed in group homes, um, communal living for, uh, for kids, kind of like summer camp that never ends and it's a lot worse than summer camp. Um, the worst part of it is when a child enters the system, uh, it's, it's a hard uh, process for them. They, they've been lived through a traumatic experience of abuse, but they are victims. That's one of the... Um, the uh, characteristics that's lost sometimes when people think about kids in foster care, they're all victims of abuse or neglect. They're not in the situation on any actions of their own. Uh, they've been through trauma, they've been through uh, grief and loss, they've been pulled away from the only consistency, even though it hasn't been great, they've still been pulled away from the only consistency they've had in life, and been placed with uh, strangers for most, on the most part. Um, that's where our program comes in. There, there are several federal laws, state statutes that exist to address issues for children in foster care that say kids should have all their needs met, that kids should have um, access to services, that these kids should have normalcy in their lives. Um, but those are well and good laws and intentions, but how are they being implemented? That's our main concern, and that's why we exist, is to hold accountable the agencies that are supposed to be applying those laws for the child. Um, our mission is to make sure that every child in the court system has a volunteer advocate uh, appointed to their case to be their representative in the system. Um, we are attempting to ensure every need of the child is being met uh, while they're in the system. Um, and that means they're that their home life is good, that they, their educational needs are being met, that they have mental, uh, uh, any mental uh, illnesses they have are being uh, met, their physical health is being addressed, they have normalcy. Um, 
we look at their whole life and try to ensure that they're having um, uh, services in place for those areas. Um, we also want them out of the system as quick as possible. As you can imagine, no kid deserves to grow up in the foster care system. Uh, even a year in the fight. By 37 to 38 is a blur to me. I don't remember really what happened in it. Uh, but and I'm sure most of you don't remember a lot of your individual years as adults, but I bet you can remember a specific year when you were a child. I remember my fourth grade year like this, right? Time is a big difference for a child versus an adult in my mind. And so every day a child spends in foster care uh, without getting into a safe, permanent home is, a, is, a, is too many days for us. Our guardians in law have come from vastly different backgrounds, and if I can go ahead and point out two of our volunteers who are sitting here. I didn't know Judy was going to be here today, but would you all mind sharing just what your, quickly, what your background is to the group? I mean, are you social workers and attorneys, or tell them who you are. Uh, no, I'm none of that. My, my background is, is business. I got involved in the guardian program in April, and I've been working for the guardian program since 2006. I got my first case, um, had uh, a lot of court experience, training, And Judy, can I just ask, did you have any experience in the, in the court prior to this? Any, any advocacy experience? Any, uh, any legal experience? Social work experience? Uh, no social work experience. Um, yeah, you know, some of it with adoption, as most of you in this room know, that we have an adopted child, Katie. But no, uh, no social work experience, no advocacy experience at all. You've heard of Katie, right? <laughs> 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 Um, so my background is in business as well, and um, I was actually a stay-at-home, I've become a stay-at-home mother over the last 10 years, and have done a variety of volunteer efforts, none of which <laughs> included anything in advocacy or court, for that matter. Um, so this is totally new territory. It is very, very professional volunteer effort, um, but in terms of direct experience in court, this, is, this was my first time in this system. <clears throat> this is the beauty of the Guardian at Lydon program in my mind is that um, uh, we recruit folks from the community who have no involvement with the system. It doesn't mean we won't take attorneys and social workers, they're still great advocates, but the folks who come into our program who are the best advocates have no experience in this. They bring real world experience into the court system, into the juvenile welfare system. That's a system that operates in a very closed box with very closed minds. And the, the great thing about Guardian Blyden is it brings a community standard into that system and says, whoa, what are you thinking? This is a kid that needs this thing. You, you bring in that community standard uh, from Guilford County. Um, we represent 560 kids in Guilford County in the foster care system on any given day. Um, throughout the year, around 750 kids total. Uh, we have around 150 volunteers currently who are representing around 310 children. Actually, those numbers are a little skewed, but we still have around 175 kids right now who don't have a volunteer advocate representing their best interests. Um, we are a very small judicial branch program. Um, those of you in law may have never heard of our program. That's how small we are. Um, across the state, we have 140 staff members. Locally, we have nine two attorneys who are on staff with us who represent all 560 children, five supervisors, and then, and then myself, an administrative support person. Uh, but we, we serve children in over 6,000 hearings a year in the juvenile court system. Um, I just want to walk you through real quick what a guardian ad litem actually does for a child. And Leslie's going to help me with this with some real world experience. But the, the first thing a trained guardian ad litem does is investigate the child's situation. They, they're, they're, they're sent out to get to know that kid. They, they go interview them, they go to their home, they um, talk to them, listen to them. Uh, that's one thing a lot of kids, I mean a lot of kids in, in general, uh, don't have adults sitting down and saying, tell me about yourself, I'll listen to you. Usually we tell our kids what to do, that's what I do with my kids. Uh, but we sit there and we get to know that child and we let them have an outlet to talk about their life and tell us what they want to happen in their own and then we interview any other adult who has a pertinent relationship with that child. We talk to their teachers, their doctors, their psychiatrists, their counselors, anyone who can tell us something about that child so we can get a good picture about what's going on in their life. 
then we review all their medical records. When a, when a judge appoints a guardian ad litem to serve in that case in that capacity, they allow that guardian to access any information about that child, whether or not confidential, that will help us or assist us in making uh, right decisions for that child. So I have a, a story here to share with you about an investigation. I'm going to ask Leslie to share one of her stories about an investigation that she's done for a child uh, on her case. Sure. I became a guardian ad litem in November of 2016, so I've been doing this just under two years. And at the time, I took two cases, and those cases represent three children. So one case is a single child, the other are full sibling sisters. And we'll start with the sisters. Their case was very um, straightforward. They were residing with grandparents because the mother was MIA and the father um, had some dependency issues and was not employed, was not able to care for them. And he came in, I thought, even though he has a lot of challenges in his life, he exhibited a lot of love and concern for his children by making sure that his parents were basically picking up where he could not in terms of care. And he wanted to give up his rights as a parent to his parents to adopt his children and so it was we basically met with the kids and asked them what they wanted they were living with the grandparents and wanted to remain there we talked to the grandparents and substantiate that this is also their desire um, dad was consistent you know these things take a long time and i think part of the reason that the cases are stretched out is to make sure you're not taking away a parent's rights unnecessarily because that's such a natural you know an important relationship if a parent can be rehabilitated and and come to a place where they can care for their kids that's what you want first and foremost and if you can't achieve that then in time you see that that path play out um, in so in this one case with the sisters everybody presented very consistent information and the investigation was fairly straightforward because all of the different points of view pointed to the same result. And those children are still, um, it's interesting, it does take a while. Um, they came into care in November of 2016. They, they have had their parents' rights terminated. They have filed for adoption. The adoption is waiting and pending to be filed downtown. So that will be a happy ending in just under a couple years. Um, the other case, was a much more difficult investigation and continues to be. Um, it's a single child who's been out of the home for many, many years. Um, it's a very odd case because you have a parent who is in prison and I never in my life thought that I would be friends or develop a relationship with someone who was imprisoned. Um, but I've gotten to know this parent. This parent is a great source of information in spite of this person's obvious challenges, they provide genuine care and concern for their, for their child, even, at, even though they're removed from the child's day-to-day -day life. Um, so investigation in that case touches everything from therapists and teachers and school counselors and the parent, foster parent. We've had, excuse me, at least three foster parent placements at this time. We've had um, several social workers on the case that have come in and out. Um, it's a completely different nature. So there's lots to investigate and things are always changing. Um, and ironically, the child, who you may have a stereotype of, a child in foster care, this child is amazing. This child is a straight A and B student, um, has some really great talent, and basically just needs the adults in her life to get out of the way so she can live her life and continue on her fairly ambitious path. So her investigation is a little more complicated. And so the next step after we investigate is we try to facilitate needs for that child to be met. Um, we have a very uh, singular purpose uh, for these children we're working with though. We were advocates, we're court appointed advocates. We provide no services to the children that we are appointed to. So we don't buy things for them, we don't babysit, we don't take them places. Uh, we solely attempt to get the decision makers, the people responsible for these children's lives, to make the right decisions for them. Those people being uh, the Department of Social Services, who has uh, legal and physical custody of the children, and then the, uh, the, the judge who is assigned to the case, who has uh, jurisdiction of that child's life. Um, so in our set of facilitation, we try to identify what issues are exist in that child's life. 
We try to locate a community resource or research what's available to meet that child's need, whether it's uh, they need a follow-up with their dentist or they need to have a uh, well check at their pediatrician that has been missed for several months or that they are supposed to, they need they want to play soccer, whatever the case may be. And then we work with a social worker to try to get that in place. Uh, people will ask, you know, well, why are you doing that? So that's a social worker's job. That's, that's why they're set up that way. Uh, the, the truth is social workers are overworked, overworked overburdened, uh, they're apathetic at times. Uh, they, they just, they, they don't always, they, and they'll tell you, we are not good parents to the kids that we have in our custody. That's why they need someone else watching out for them. Um, Leslie, you want us to tell us a story about how you've facilitated services for a child? Sure, I've had a great experience facilitating a service this summer, actually. Um, the, one of the children that I was just telling you about, who is such a great student and very talented, um, she has a very strong um, musical talent. And we weren't really sure how strong it was, because I don't know how to assess her. Um, but she had applied for some various programs and was accepted to a very prestigious school over in Winston-Salem. And the question became, how is she going to get there? Because this is, you know, this is an expensive, uh, multi-week camp experience for her. And, but in my mind as a parent, you asked about experience earlier. Even though I have no legal experience and have no um, advocacy experience, I think the most important thing I bring to the table is being a parent who cares about my kids and takes care of them. I look at this child as if she's practically one of my own. Um, I want her to have the same experiences. I want her to have the same opportunities. So when she basically auditioned for it, was accepted into this amazing program, it wasn't, are you going to go? It's, how are we going to get you there? And I think that is a little bit of the, the luxury of being a guardian ad litem is that you can have that within your expectations set, whereas an opportunity like that might completely overwhelm um, DSS because they're not in the business of taking care of that level of need for a child. So um, thanks to some very generous people in our community, we raised um, some private funds to enable her to receive tuition and attend this program. And she had such a fabulous experience that they now have their eye on her and want to further invest in her because she has such legitimate talent. So. It's just like this amazing story, like it would blow your mind. You know, you see somebody with all this potential and opportunity and they just need a little help, like any other kid getting there. So facilitating for her is a little challenging because her the demand is high, um, but it's what you would do as a parent of your own child. And to put it bluntly, that's just, that, that child would never have been in that camp if it wasn't for Leslie advocating for that and helping find solutions for that. DSS is not, they would look at it and say, we can't do it, can't afford it, we're moving on to the next kid. So uh, that's one of the great roles we can play for a child. Um, the final step of what we do is we report to the court. We attend and represent the children in a, uh, in a uh, dual representation model with an attorney. Uh, is co-appointed with a guardian ad litem and we both present information to a judge during regularly scheduled court hearings that occur on a, uh, on a quarterly basis to update the judge on what is going on in that child's life. The children are of course invited to attend their court hearings so we accompany them to court and we help champion them and, and, and help them feel comfortable speaking to the court. Um, most hearings we write a report that serves as evidence for that hearing and then we um, uh, we give testimony to the judge about what we believe is uh, in the child's best interest in terms of getting them out of foster care and how we can make sure their needs are being met. And most importantly, we get to express to the judge the child's wishes or the child's expressed wishes in their life. What do they want to happen in their life? So that judge has that firm stance from the child when they're making decisions about what's going on there. <laughs> then of course, the judge makes decisions based on the recommendations that we make for our children. So, Leslie, you want to give us a, a court story? Sure. I'm, I'm thinking of, I remember sitting in training. It's a six-week training program um, when you are trying to become a guardian ad litem. And I remember wondering, like, how in the world am I going to meet with children I don't know and try to figure out what it is they want? Like, is it easy or hard to connect with them? You know, how, what are, what are the tricks for this? And it was really cute. You may have experienced this as well in your early work, Judy. 
Um, so I went to the home to meet with these two sisters before their first court date. And I was you know, in my jeans and my t-shirt and sat down on the floor with them and started asking, particularly this young child, what is it that you want? You know, I know that we don't know each other well, and man, the second you ask a kid what they want, they are off and running. <laughs> she had no problem telling me about, you know, not her deepest feelings, but she told me exactly what she wanted. Um, she was very straightforward about, you know, I want to see this person. I don't want to see this person. I want to live here. I don't want to go there. Um, it was, it was great. So, you know, they're little people. They know exactly what they want, what they like, what they don't like. And so in some ways it's a real treat to be able to sit with them and say, what do you want? I'm the adult who's gonna help you get your voice heard in court. And then you tell them about court, what to expect. If they wanna go, they can go. If they don't wanna go, they don't have to go. I'll speak for them. Um, it's also a really neat feature of the program. I think that the judges will allow the children to speak to them outside the courtroom so these children were invited back into judges chambers to sit with the judge for about 10 15 minutes and and i think it's wonderful the kids spoke again they had to sort of be given permission to speak to the judge because they're there in their robe and they look so official um, but the kids speak they say what they want and it's a wonderful feeling to make sure that they actually get to voice what they want to happen in their life because it's their life so it's great and so to become a guardian ad litem, um, it's, it is not an easy task. It is, like Leslie said, a professional volunteer experience. Um, there's an application, interview, background check, screening process, essentially, uh, that's, uh, uh, that takes quite a while, including 30 hours <coughs> of uh, prerequisite training that has to be completed. Um, and then the service as a guardian ad litem is around 12 hours a, a month. It's, uh, it's very flexible, however, it is something that is continuous for that child throughout the duration of their court case, which can be on average between 20 and 24 months in Guilford County. Uh, but what that leads to is helping change the life, the course of a child's life. We enter a child's um, uh, life at a very uh, tumultuous time for them. And when we say goodbye, we feel comfortable knowing they'll never have to be exposed to something like this again in their life. And there's just something inherently wonderful about knowing I helped touch someone's life that way where they're going to have a different shot than they ever had when I first met them. Um, and then the measurable outcomes of being a guardian of the I think they're just amazing. Kids are in foster care a shorter amount of time when they have a volunteer appointed to their case. They receive more services while they're in foster care when they have a guardian of the appointed to their case. And of course, they have their voice heard by the judge in every court hearing that occurs in their case. Um, so there are several ways that we we can ask you to help uh, the guardian ad litem if you're intrigued to. Of course, the first one is to volunteer, become a guardian ad litem. I assume everyone in this room would be acceptable to be a guardian ad litem. Um, you can help us spread the word. We're a small, very small judicial branch uh, uh, program who doesn't have uh, any money at all to spend on, on uh, advertisements. That's why you have not heard of us if you haven't. Um, so we would love to come speak to any organization or spread the word we can any way that we can. Um, and we do accept tax buckle donations to assist with volunteer recruitment, retention, and education for our volunteers. Um, but I appreciate you all having us here and, and taking the time to listen to 